I want to talk a little bit about SRE, um, which is what I am. It's basically operations, but with an engineering focus. Uh, if you saw Tammy talk at the SysAdmin Miniconf yesterday, you probably have a pretty good idea about what it is. Uh, mostly, we are re primarily responsible for the upkeep, the uptime, the availability of the service. But we also try and make sure that we're not actually spending a lot of time doing operations. We're really trying to engineer ourselves out of all of that manual labor so we can, we can scale. So given that we're doing a lot of development, that obviously makes us real DevOps engineers. Um, monitoring is one of the many tools that we have available in our toolkit, which is why I like, feel like I'm going to talk about this stuff. Monitoring is a lot of different things, kind of loosely grab bagged into this uh, label. And here is a terrible false dichotomy of two particular axes I particularly chose of those things, right? Uh, the granularity of how you're going to measure kind of affects whether or not you're being doing performance analysis versus capacity planning, which is probably you know looking into the future. So it doesn't really matter if you have microsecond granularity. Um, the time since the event occurs probably tells you whether or not you're responding immediately to a failure or trying to understand a failure well past uh, it occurred so you can prevent it happening again. Today, I'm only going to talk really about failure detection because obviously this is a big topic. Uh, a long time ago, I became aware that monitoring was probably a thing that needed to happen. And you know, it was pretty basic, making sure machines were up and, and alerting you to say that the machine was no longer up. A little while later, I deployed my first Nagios instance. And that was pretty awesome because it was very exciting, very powerful. Uh, basic check alert, sorry, check and alert monitoring where you write little scripts and they do a thing and they report back to the central scheduler whether or not the thing was OK. Uh, we call this black box monitoring. It performs a probe like a user performs a probe. There's no introspection into the internal state of the system generally. I'm going to hand wave a little bit. Uh, Nagios bolted on performance data collection a little while later and stuck that in a little database. And it wasn't really used for any alerting, because the check scripts were ones performing that task. But you could always uh, ask this data later and, and draw it on a screen so you could use it for uh, later um, investigation into draw charts and, and so forth. And then, of course, Nagios is big, because it's expensive to run, and you have to figure out how to scale. So we can still get to the moon with it and perform a lot of things. But we start to feel like the uh, technology is beginning to show its age, such as forking every process costs a lot in, in time and latency and um, CPU overhead. The complexity of the configuration file grows with the number of targets being um, monitored. Now, of course, we build tools around that. Um, around this time, configuration management kicks off. And suddenly, we can automatically generate a lot of these configuration files from other databases. So the cost of actually maintaining it is still kind of low, but it's still very expensive and a multiple phase process to keep this thing up and running. So I mentioned black box monitoring already. And the asterisk means it's maybe not traditional so much as kind of what was being done for a while. Um, the white box monitoring, the performance data, which is the introspection into the system, isn't being involved in our alerts. It's going into databases so we can plot charts and do some retroactive uh, analysis. Now, I joined Google about uh, the end of 2006. And shortly afterwards, I learned about this new tool called Borgmon. Uh, and it really blew my mind. It took me a couple of more years to understand how it really worked. But it kind of inverted the whole process. It was not um, a Nagios-like tool at all, but it was a uh, very powerful uh, monitoring tool. It was a new way of thinking about how to detect failures in, in uh, systems. And it was incredibly reusable. Every team at Google ended up using it. Uh, the same binary with uh, a little bit of, um, like you, you could program it. And the interfaces to it were the same across all of the things. And this suddenly meant that we weren't deploying large Nagios instances to, to monitor everything anymore. It was, we had this single shared binary that everyone understood and, and could move between teams and still understand how the monitoring worked. So I talked about this at PuppetConf in 2012. And I came to LCA in 2014 at the SysAdmin MiniConf, and I talked about it then. And I didn't say what it was called, or how it worked, or why it worked, or why it was good. I just kind of said, 
ah, look, here's a diagram. You could probably imagine <laughs> that it's really cool. And everyone kind of looked at me and went, what are you talking about? And I feel bad because I couldn't give you something to go away with that day and say, this is how it works. This is how Google does monitoring. You should totally go and do that in your own companies, in your own homes. Uh, but then we published this paper a couple of years ago, and now I can totally tell you about how Borgmon works. So Borgmon, metric collector. It's a time series database. It's all of these things. And I'm not going to show you about Borgmon itself, because it's not open source. I'm going to show you about Prometheus. So now is in a very ex exciting time, because oh, there's a uh, a renaissance, I suppose, in open source monitoring tools. In the last couple of years, we've seen Prometheus, uh, Boson, uh, the Mozilla project has created Heka, and there's uh, the closure-based Riemann. Uh, these are all now stream-based processes that are programmable that you can use to uh, build your monitoring systems. But obviously, I'm going to talk about Prometheus, which, as you saw in the earlier slide, is almost identical to Borgmon. So I will tell you about how Google does monitoring with Borgmon, but I'll use Prometheus to show you how to do it. And that way, you can go home and use Prometheus, and it'll be totally awesome. Uh, it's very simple. The interface is plain text variables being exported from targets, and that's the API which allows it to scale across multiple targets without having to write individual checks. The rule sets are programmable DSL that explain, uh, that describe the relationships between these time series that you can perform computations on. It's kind of vector arithmetic. And then you can specify particular types of rules that say whether or not an alert condition has occurred. All of this data gets recorded into the time series database, so you can look at them and uh, navigate around. That's OK. So in a very trivial uh, example, you'd have a task, a Borgmon, and a user looking at the browser, looking at the Borgmon, which is looking at the task. Using service discovery, like the uh, BNS, the Borg name service, or DNS itself, um, Kubernetes uh, has a naming system, console has a naming system. Any one of these things will help you find, you, you program in the Borgmon and say, my task looks like this, please go find out where they really are, and it will go off and scrape all of the Vasi pages, yes? What is the four slash Vasi referred to? Oh, sorry. I, didn't cover that too well. Slash Vazi is a HTML and HTTP endpoint that exports plain text key value pairs. Okay. So the service pulls up the client. That is right. I was going to get to that in a little while, but it doesn't matter. I'll tell you about that right now, if it clarifies the things. Um, Borgmon sends alerts as key value pairs, like similar kind of stuff, back to uh, a program called the Alert Manager. The Alert Manager then decides who needs to receive that notification and sends it through a bunch of notification methods back to a user, maybe the same person who's looking at the, the console right now. The long-term storage is through a uh, ingestion pipeline, a big database. And then there's a lookup system so individual Borgmons can then go back and query old data. Even though they don't have it in their current memory, you can still write expressions in it to say, um, please tell me about what happened seven days ago. Of course, you want to monitor that your monitoring system works, so you can stick out the Borgmons on top of Borgmons. You can do the same with Prometheus. Uh, and if your service gets really big, then you might want to shard out the collection part. So you can sprinkle little shards around in between the service and the monitoring system and help it scale that way. Uh, if you are ever going for an interview at Google and you get a question you don't understand the answer to, uh, just say, I'll add shards, and that will uh, pass. <laughs> OK, so that's how metrics get into the monitoring system. Uh, but we still have to program it to do things with all of those metrics. Um, so the idea behind alert design is figuring out uh, how to make monitoring not suck by choosing what the right things are to be alerting on. Um, so we have this idea of service level things, three letter acronyms. Uh, service level indicator is just a measurement, right? The goal that you're trying to achieve, we call the service level objective. And this is what we talk about internally all the time, because SLOs are basically the, the contract between teams about what a service is going to do. If you're providing a car service to another company, you might have an SLA. You're probably all familiar with SLAs, an agreement that if you don't do the thing you're contractually obligated to do, then there'll be some financial uh, incentive, the opposite of incentive, penalty, I suppose. Um, so. 
An example is we are offering a service that's supposed to have three nines of um, response latency below some particular threshold. So we can measure the, the response latency, bucket size that, and that's our indicator. If we say that it has to be below five milliseconds over an interval of time, that's now our objective. We can very easily measure that uh, indicator against that, that objective and say whether or not we're, we're meeting it. And then obviously, if we fail to do that, um, well, we get paged. Somebody exchanges money. Uh, a useful thing about this tool is that clients tend to provision events, SLOs. If you're able to guarantee that a service is going to do a thing, then people can build their services in a way that capitalizes on that. And whether or not you're providing the SLO they need, they can build their service around it to improve their own service, get uh, a better SLO. So if you read that paper, there's some techniques such as I have multiple replicas of the same data. I'm going to send off two reads instead of one, and that way reduce the tail by racing the two of, uh, racing the two of them. Uh, but coming back to alert design, when you get paged, like, it's, it's all well and good to say things are wrong, so I should page somebody, but it's very important to understand the other side of that, which is when you do get paged, what are you going to do about it? And if the answer is I silence the pages and I go back to sleep, uh, you still have a problem. So the idea is that every time you get paged, it should make you feel like I need to, like, action stations and figure it out. But if you do have this um, persistent alerts that go off and you go, oh, it's just that thing that um, it always goes off, maybe you should delete that alert. Uh, so think about this. What's the action I'm going to take in order to do that? And if you end up finding that the action is scriptable, then you should probably script that and get rid of the alert. It's still good to have diagnostic alerts. So, oh, my disk is full, but you don't have to page on them. You can show them on a console so that when you do get paged for something that's actually important, you can log into the console and say, oh, these correlate very well. I understand why the server is running slow. It's because the disk is full. OK, so I've talked at a very high level about a bunch of boring history that you're probably not interested in and some theoretical alert design stuff. I'm going to throw that all away now. We're going to start from the very bottom instead of the top and uh, get some monitoring data into a Prometheus and then fire some alerts. I say that's bottom up because I've just said you should design it from the top and go, oh, we're going to have our alert. And then obviously from the alert, we should figure out what metrics will drive that alert. And then we'll add that instrumentation to our binaries. I'm going to do it the other way around because I feel like it will explain the concepts a lot easier. So uh, a client API, you say, I would like some variables, a metric. It's going to have a name. It's going to have some documentation. And when an event occurs, I'm going to do something like increment it. And that's that. This is the entire user API of the Prometheus client. Um, Golang has an XBAR library as well, which is very similar. You just go, I would like a variable, and I'd like to increment it sometimes. So here's the plain text output. Um, we have the help, which says what the thing is for. Uh, it says it's a counter. And then there's the name of it and a value. And then we've got another one, which is a map type, which so it's a a table, I suppose, a table of errors, and now we can count individual error types by code. Yes? So is the client talking to Prometheus or is it just exporting? No, this metric? particular client is exporting through an HTTP <laughs> endpoint on that same binary. Clarifying the, the slash vars that you had in your earlier graphs, the slash metrics there. Oh, very good. Um, the slash metrics is a Prometheus convention. It maps identically to the slash vars that Google has internally. Uh, some tips on how to make metrics. You should always use counters. Let Prometheus do any aggregations for you. Prefer numbers. Don't export timestamps. And always initialize variables at the start of your program. Uh, why, why is it important for you to export raw counters rather than rates of things? Well, apart from the CPU cost of you having to compute the rates of things, um, time series have types. Prometheus is a polling agent. It is scraping the metrics thing every duty cycle. Counters will uh, preserve order. They, well, you can read the slide. Gauges, which are like rates, so rates can go up and down, um, are not monotonic. This is, this is a problem because of sampling rates. So counters, you can guarantee that we haven't missed any data in between a scrape. Right? Gauges, on the other hand, could mean anything. And it looks like totally the same. But we've totally missed all of those spikes in between. We don't understand why things got slow in between those um, two sampling points. 
another thing is you shouldn't use strings. The simple answer is Prometheus doesn't support strings, but if you have... <laughs> Vogman supports strings. Uh, probably a bad, desi bad design decision. The um, understanding how many errors occurred is much more useful than knowing what the last error that occurred is for the same reasons that you might want to compute rates of them. Um, we want to see how the number of errors changes over time. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine useful examples. Why do you not want to export a timestamp of like the last time this succeeded? Yes. Um, oh, I don't have a hit. Prometheus knows what time it just collected the data, so it's, to, it's built in. It, it stores a value and a timestamp together every time it scrapes. So you can compute the time rather than uh, store it directly. OK, so now we're collecting the data. We have to tell Prometheus where our targets are. It has a global config, which is a YAML file, which has um, who are my targets and which rules should I load. The rules files are a little DSL, which, uh, all right, so globally we want to say there's a, a default scrape interval of one minute. Uh, we're going to apply some labels to everything we collect. And then there's um, other guff that says how we're going to collect things and what rules we're going to apply. So we'll get to the rules in a little while. Scrape configs basically say, I have a job. I want to call it the SMTP job. This is where I find them. Uh, OK, so this is going back to service discovery. I'm mapping particular job types to targets in, in space, I suppose, in the cloud. You can specify them uh, statically. You can use, I think the SD configs is like a bunch of files on disk, but we'll keep polling them, like use iNotify, and if they change, we'll reload and get a new list of targets. Um, if you look up server records, you can get the list of things. You can use console, you can use Kubernetes, and uh, various other really awesome service discovery uh, Zookeeper, I think, is another one. I'm just going to throw out names and, and assume that they're correct. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've, I've mentioned labeling. Uh, when we name a time series early, we said things like errors, and the code, the code is a label on that errors time series name. We've added other things, like the name of the job is SMTP or bar server. Um, how do we store all this stuff? Well, a service is multiple binaries running many tasks in lots of machines, in a bunch of data centers, but we need to keep all of this data organized and allow us to be able to query it and break it down and perform mathematical computations on it. So how do we keep this big database of numbers uh, in a useful format? The time series arena is what Borgman calls it. I think Prometheus just calls it uh, the time series database. Um, a set of unique labels describes any single time series. So that's the full set of key value pairs in a list that can identify any single set of values going back in time. So uh, if you have a label set going across the bottom, you can imagine that the database is just a giant matrix of each time we do a scrape, we append a line at the bottom, everything shifts up, it goes back into infinity. Each of these little labels is a full set of key value pairs, a list of key value pairs. These labels come from the name of the job, which we've identified as there's an MTP, SMTP server. It's running on a particular host. The target itself exports metrics, the name of the variable, errors, any other additional labels, like which error code it was. In the Prometheus, the Borgman configuration, we can add additional labels to say, well, this is the Prometheus that's running in the US West data center. So I'd like to annotate all of the targets that it scrapes. It also is there to say, the thing that collected the data was in US West, because the thing that being collected might be in a different data center, which can sometimes be useful for figuring out whether or not you've had a network um, uh, cut. And finally, the processing rules themselves, which we'll get to, can add additional labels as the computations occur. So here's an example of a few time series at the most recent point in time. Like I said, it's a list of key value pairs. There's some curly braces to group them together, um, keys, and then a string. We can query this by saying the variable name and then any additional labels to subset that group. So here is an expression for errors where the job is the web, and that uh, blue box should be a little taller and collect all of them. But you can see how that expression matches a whole lot, so it's going to return a vector of time series that match. 
the job web zone US West is going to match three of them. Pay no attention to the fact that the uh, overlap is all wrong. <laughs> but again, it's returning a vector, in this case, three time series, because those are the time series that match that uh, vector expression. If we specify all the labels, we're going to match a single expression. Sorry, if we're, as, we're precise enough to match a single expression, then we'll return a single, a single element vector. Um, and you might notice this if you read carefully that uh, one of these labels is unnecessary because uh, there is sufficient other variables. The, um, I think the zone label is, yes, I wrote my notes here. The zone label is unnecessary in this particular expression because the time series that are up there will match if you drop that one as well. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, okay, so now 60 slides in, we're at the meat of the talk where the, uh, the real magic happens. We're gonna create some new time series with what we call recording rules. So I would like to rate, I compute the rate of change of the requests of the web server, and I will do it like this. Uh, so a query for request by instance has two data points in time, uh, and then the result will be a single data point because I've computed the, the rate over the last 10 seconds, I suppose. So the important parts of this expression are the variable reference, a range expression, which says how far back in time to look, and a function, which we'll apply over the top of that to say, okay, rate over the last 10 seconds of the web server requests. Pretty straightforward, right? I'm gonna record it in a new variable called task colon request colon rate 10 seconds. This is a Google convention that is built out into Prometheus, so you'll probably see the same thing out if you look at um, Prometheus rules in the wild. The prefix is the level that we're computing to. So uh, in this particular example, the input data is from individual tasks, and we have done no aggregation across that whole job. So I'm recomputing the rate for the same task. So you should find that there's a mapping easily between the request variable and the rate of request variable for the very same machine. The operation being applied, the rate over 10 seconds gets suffixed, so you know how that thing was computed. Uh, we can change the um, function and we change the name. In perform deltas, blah, blah, blah. So is that just a convention? It's totally a convention. No, you can do what you like. Back. Absolutely do what you like. If you would like other people to understand, this is the convention. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned aggregation. We've um, computed a task level rate, which is at the same granularity as every single task we've just scraped, but maybe you'd also like to understand the rate of requests across the whole data center. That seems useful to know, because you've built a cluster, let's treat it as a single unit. Uh, so we would like to sum, keeping the job and zone labels, but discarding the instance label to say where they came from. Uh, that's what this expression does, sum by blah of tasks, and so we sum all the things. Uh, finally, you probably want to get a global one, maybe you have multiple data centers and so you want to know the global performance of the service at any point in time as well. Oh, yes, great. Um, so yeah, the, the by notation just means here are the labels in the source data that I would like you to join on. Um, I suppose it's similar to a group by expression in SQL. And everything else that is gonna be different, so in our source data we have an instance label. Let me just... Uh, Flick back. So I've got an instance label which tells me the exact machine and port that it came from. That information will be dropped when we aggregate to the data center level because obviously it doesn't make sense to have a single machine be a data center. And again, when we go to the global one, we're going to drop the zone label because that tells us what data center it is. Yes? Uh, it's probably worth noting that I think convention wise, Prometheus doesn't allow columns for the, the names. They use uh, underscores. Really? Uh, that was. All right. You might be able to sneak it in there, but they've been stamping down hard. The point of contention is that I might be totally wrong with Prometheus, Prometheus's convention with the colon separated thing. So totally check that out. Prometheus.io. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to use the uh, Google convention because that's what I know, and I'm giving the talk, so <laughs> shut up. <laughs> the. I've mentioned aggregation. We, this is how you build topologies, right? You've got a service which is distributed a bunch of, uh, across the planet globally, sorry, physically distributed across the planet, and there are um, failure domains, right, where 
a data center could fail or a single machine could fail. And so I want to break down this topology into those units so that if I need to drill down in any piece of component, I can start at the top level and then break it down and, and follow it down until I find the thing that's the subset of things that is broken. The other thing that we want to do is that every one of these individual tasks is acting in itself uh, in a way that uh, two, two variables have a strong meaning with each other, so a schema, if you will. The number of errors being emitted per second is totally relevant to the number of requests that's coming in because you know how many times you're failing to give the user a response. So we can say that there's a relationship between two variables at the same level and we want to do some analysis of those as well. I guess that's a long-winded way of saying maybe you would like to compute the ratio of errors to requests in your job. This is how you do it. So we've got a new little expression here. Uh, obviously, computing ratio is a division operation. Uh, we would like to join the two expressions on the job label so that you're not, say, computing the rate of errors of the SMTP service against the web service. That doesn't seem like a good idea. But maybe we'd like to say the rate of requests of the web service is totally relevant to the rate of errors of the web service. Uh, but, you know, we exported the errors by code, so maybe we want to preserve the code label on the output. This is a little magic that says, join on group, on job, sorry, but keep the fan out of code in the results. So we're going to say all of the 200 errors, keep them together and say that's the 200s over total requests, the 500s over total requests, the 404s over total requests. All right, demo time. How are we doing for time? Ooh. Running a little bit slow, but that's okay. Um, all right. Hang on, there we go. All right. I have got, I have forgotten how to type. Um, I've got a small web server that exports a bunch of data as Prometheus. Um, format stuff. Here I import the client Golang, create some variables, and here we go. Every time we receive a the handle func for slash high says I'm going to call the handle func handle high. Cool. Here it is. Um, we increment the request counter as the request comes in. Uh, I perform a database lookup. This is just um, yeah. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's a simulation, right? Sometimes it fails. With 5% chance, it's going to do a 500 error, and with a 10% chance, it's going to return a 400 error. We, if that happens, like I've done a backend lookup, and I've got a response back, and something has gone horribly wrong. I'm going to set the response code to 400 and 500. Um, I'm also going to record that in the errors map, which will be export. And then at the end, I'm going to record the latency. Um, what's nanoseconds divided by a million? That's the units that I'm exporting in. I've called it milliseconds, so let's go with that. I've also got a little load balancer. The load balancer performs a blocking read of the back end as an HTTP client. It is really awesome. It knows if there's an error response from the back end and records that and also records the time it took. Very simple, right? Okay. So I have a script that just runs them. I'll show you the script. I run some backends and I run a load balancer pointing at the backends. Cool. Uh, Prometheus. I run Prometheus. Great. Let's do that. I guess I am running it already. Cool. And I'm going to run the alert manager. Now let me show you what they look like. Here is Prometheus. We've got a status page. It says, huh, let me um, do that. That's much better, isn't it? OK, it's been running for a while. It's got some information. Here's the configuration that is loaded into it. I'm scraping and evaluating, scraping the targets every one second, evaluating the rule set every one second. I'm applying the label BLTS to the targets. The conf jobs I'm scraping are my hard-coded list of things. I've called the servers S, and I've called the load balancer LB. 
And then I'm going to load three rules files called tasks, errors, and latency.rules. And here they are, aggregated together. Um, if you were paying attention before, you could probably read this. I don't expect you all to manage that. You can do it in your own time. That's homework. <laughs> Answers tomorrow on my desk. Uh, and here are all the targets that are being scraped. They appear to be up. That's pretty cool. So let's. I've got a little uh, Apache bench there. I don't know what the flags. I don't remember what the flags do, but it's polling the load balancer for high every whatever that means. But it doesn't matter. I don't have to remember because. You can totally go to the graph page and say job uh, requests rate, that one, yeah, execute. There we go. The server is doing 47 QPS and the um, load balance is doing 45 QPS. You know, there's uh, some latency in between the two, so the numbers are slightly off, but they're about accurate. And then if we graph it over the last one minute, cool, wow. Let's say 50 QPS, give or take. And I suppose if I keep clicking execute, this will keep moving. Yeah, all right, great, service is working. Um, but that one is not very interesting. What we really wanna do is cause it to fail. So here's a lot of Apache benches running a lot more bigger numbers. Um, when I first wrote this, I thought I was having a triangular progression of increasing load by launching more Apache benches with um, a little sleep in between. I'm pretty certain I don't know what it does. <laughs> but I also made sure the demo worked before I started today, so I don't know. I didn't sacrifice anything to the demo gods now, so here it goes. Um, an interesting thing to watch right now is the little service page. Wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> okay, no. All right, QPS has gone up. Wow, that's pretty cool. I wonder what the errors looks like. So let's go get our job errors. Yeah, go. Ooh, errors has gone up. Wow, looks like you might say 10% of errors are 400, and 5% of them are internal server errors. Oh no, look at that. Some of them are too many open files from the load balancer. <laughs> yeah. It's not reporting that yet. That's weird. No, doesn't matter. Um, so this is, this is working as intended for the demo. The service is supposed to be crap. If it wasn't crap, then there'd be nothing to alert on. Um, so we're gonna look at the alerts. Page. This is the, um, oh, I'll go back to status, you can see the rules that I created. I'm pretty sure I didn't actually have a slide describing any of this stuff, I realize. <laughs> Why did I do that? All right, so let's talk through this one. The alert with the name tasks missing, if the ratio of jobs that are up <laughs> right now is smaller than 0.9, so 90% of the jobs or less Sorry, exactly less than, strictly less than. For 10 seconds or more, then I'll fire an alert that's called tasks missing from the particular job. The one that we're actually interested in right now is the error ratio too high. Um, I've already shown you how you compute the ratio rate and I'm gonna compare it to 20%. So if the error ratio goes above 20%, I want a page. And I'm only gonna wait two seconds for this condition to hold before we send the page. Uh, the labels here, severity page and the severity info above here, if you can all follow along with that, um, is some information we're gonna pass to alert manager to tell it how to handle our alert. Like I said before, you don't have to page in all alerts. Some of them are just diagnostic in nature. Um, I declare that our uh, error ratio and our latency to high alerts are our SLO alerts and everything else is just diagnostic. Let's see how's it going. Ah, cool, look, it's broken. And Apache Bench is having trouble. So we should see, um, or maybe not. Anyway, you can click on a bunch of stuff, get a chart. <laughs> that looks pretty high. It should fire very soon. Did you plug your mobile in? 
you think it's going to page me? <laughs> so that looks pretty high. Look, um, the load balance is the one I'm interested in. So I'm just showing off the cool UI tricks right now, so pay attention. You can click on stuff. It highlights different things. So this is the, all of the things that match the expression, and you know I only want interested in one of them. Of course, I could type the full expression here. I could say um, job equals LB, and then I'd get just job equals LB. Cool. We totally should have sent an alert by now. <sighs> Demos, man. Oh yeah, what does it evaluate to you? So this is cool, the alert expression is itself a time series between one and zero. Um, error ratio too high, firing for LB is that one, so it went low. <laughs> cool. It's actually a cool view, like. Yeah, right. It's like a really good debug view. It is a really good debug. You go, why is my alert not firing? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, the threshold expression here only shows the results that are higher than the threshold, so it truncates some of the expression here. The lowest bit should be higher, I mean it should always strictly be higher than 0.2 in this view. And I am at a loss why it's not alerting you. I should only have to hold for two seconds according to my, my rule here, for two seconds. All right. Oh, I know why it's not alerting. I didn't run alert manager, did I? <laughs> no, I did, I did, I did. Yeah. You retract that laugh. Okay. It does. But the fact that the alert is not firing Prometheus tells me that alert looking at alert manager isn't going to, that's called deduction. So alert manager, let me show you what it looks like is this. It's very boring because nothing is happening. Uh, yeah, so it's got a very simple configuration. Um, every time it receives a page that, uh, sorry, it receives an alert, uh, if there's nothing matches further on, I'm going to use the default one. The default receiver has nothing in it, so it's not going to do anything with it, which is pretty awesome. Um, the Slack demo receiver matches on severity equals page, and then we'll do this, and then it's going to send it off to a Slack channel, which was going to be the totally awesome demo part. What you would expect to see if anything was working right now is the alerts thing would show you there would be an alert that it had received, communication between processes. So why is the console alert manager showing alerts received? It's not. Oh, no, it is. <laughs> it is receiving a notification of an alert that is currently not firing. So Prometheus is constantly communicating with the alert manager to say, hey, buddy, nothing. <laughs> uh, let's talk about silences. Were this to be paging, I could totally put in a silence and it would stop notifying me. The alert trick condition would continue to come from Prometheus, but I could tell the alert manager that that's cool, I understand what's happening, please don't tell me about it anymore. And using all of the same label expressions as before, I can have a query that matches a lot or a little. So I can be very specific. I can say, I would like to silence everything in a data center. I would like to silence only that particular alert. Yes? Is it possible you've got a silence on somewhere already? Um, I would expect to see, is it possible I have a silence on already? No. I would expect to see a silence here. Um, definitely the problem is not with the alert manager. The problem is with Prometheus having a hissy fit or a lack thereof. I don't know. I'm at a loss. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Had this happened, we would have seen another alert manager channel uh, alert appear in my Slack channel right now to say, error ratio is too high. And I'd go, cool, and I'd click on it, and then it would take me back to the local alert manager and show me that alert that it just sent. And I would go, cool, silence. Yeah. All right, let's go back to this. It would have been cool. Um, GitHub, Jaxor with a zero, BLTS for better living through statistics is where all this code is. Go check it out. Um, all right, so let me recap. The idea, the primary idea behind Borgmon and why it's so much awesome, awesomer than a Nagios based configuration is that we've transposed this idea of checking and alerting and then telling the thing whether or not to, sorry, checking and, 
a threshold and then feeding all of that, like a single bit of information back to send an alert um, into this. We're going to stream all of these metrics in and then have another process that can run computations across all of the time series at once. Is this um, empowers you at this high level to write less code and do more, right? So we can lower the cost of maintenance, which is really important for making everything not suck. Is as your server scales, as the cost of everything goes up, in order to keep you guys sane, you need to keep the burden of overhead low. So use metrics, don't use checks. And the uh, theoretical stuff I touched on at the start is that we should design our alerts based on service level objectives. What is important to the business, this is totally DevOps, not what the uh, service, the technology of the service seems to demand. So don't worry about disk space fullness if you're not providing a storage service. Worry that the web application is up. Worry that the database is performing queries in a reasonable amount of time if that's, in fact, what the other business units need. Uh, do I have any more? Yeah, that's the end. Now it is time for questions. Does this mean my SMTP server has to the HTTP server so it gets spread for Prometheus? Can you repeat the question? Does it mean that my SMTP server has to export Prometheus-style metrics to work? No, there are exporting proxies that support a whole lot of things like MySQL and, um, let's pick a random one, Prosfix, sure. Um, Apache status things as transpose. A lot of these things are just, I understand the specific tool and I understand Prometheus metrics, so let me just pour, form a little transposition of that data and then uh, get scraped off. So typically, I suppose you would run your mail server and you'd run your little Prometheus exporter right next to it. Uh, I feel like that's not such a cost because I, you'd probably be running a StatsD or a Collecti right next to it as well anyway, or in place of. Uh, yes. You, Mike. Um, you said that we should use board, board counters. Um, what about things where you want to report how long a particular thing took, took which is under the collection time, say one minute, mm -hmm. it takes 80 seconds for something to work? Um, I have in my uh, server a, a latency histogram. And I suppose if I had more time, I could show you what it looks like in thing. But it, it is bucketizing the response times of the query so that we're exporting a, uh, a histogram to Prometheus. Prometheus can aggregate the histograms across all the things because the buckets are the same. And then we can uh, look at, say, the 99th percentile of that, that histogram. So that histogram is individual values of 18 seconds? Or? It is counting the number of times that a value falls in the bucket range. So you'd say there are like the 0 to 2 millisecond bucket, 5%, oh, sorry, 5 queries fell in that, and then thing. Sorry. A question about the alert manager. Um, if you can compare and contrast with Nagios, which has a feature um, of flat detection, so if uh, things going in and out of alert, right. you just get, well, in, in and out of threshold, you just get one alert rather than 100. Uh, normally, we would program Prometheus itself to prevent that. The, uh, the trigger holds the for expression in the alert. Um, so this for expression for two seconds means that that condition has to hold for at least two evaluation cycles before it's considered to be holding. And the idea is that if it's flapping more regularly than that, yeah, I mean, how long do you make the, the window before you... You've got to trade off bet between how fast do I want to know about the event versus whether or not it's flapping. I don't mind if you call out so we can save your legs. Okay. Uh, so I, I understand that Prometheus's time series storage thingy is uh, uh, still just file system based. I was wondering if you had a recommended method for scaling that up perhaps beyond one server's file system. Uh, I don't have a recommendation. Thanks. I encourage you to explore and experiment. There was one on this side. Apparently, it supports different backends. This may be the same question, but yeah, you said it. You mentioned it was, but it stores everything in memory right now. What do you do when you have more time series than you have memory in a single system? Uh, I think. All right, I'm very. Ver hmm. Charting, yeah, very good. Support it natively. I see you are paying attention. Thank you. Um, I think the way level DB works is because it is just emitting stuff onto the file system. I'm just going to make some stuff up because I'm not fully uh, around the full details of how Prometheus does this. 
I think the RAM stuff is then checkpointed to disk using LevelDB, and LevelDB handles the um, tail of files being written. So the, the most recent ones are still mirrored in RAM, but really old data just happens to be on disk. And I think if you write a, the right query, it will reread all of that stuff. But now I'm definitely into making up stuff territory. So you should. Yeah, so I think it uses the level DB under the hood, and I think that's how level DB works. Unfortunately, this will be the last question. Then I'll take the gentleman up the back. <laughs> all right, I'll take the gentleman here. How do I build beautiful dashboards? <laughs> Who knows? Read an Edward Tufty book. Uh, Grafana does interface with Prometheus. There's a, um, let me just pull up the website. Something documentation. Prometheus.io, if I haven't already drilled that into you guys. Um, here, Grafana. Grafana supports Prometheus. There, beautiful dashboards. There's also a tool called PromDash, which the authors of the Prometheus uh, write, which just uses plain old Go templates. You write a little template file, you ship it, it embeds expression things and charts them. So you can, there's a, a lot of uh, flexibility there. But it's definitely an external tool not built into Prometheus that you would build a console with. Oh, yeah, so Prometheus, the, the export, the, um, the proxy shims ex support a whole bunch of other monitoring infrastructure, like um, getting stuff out of Graphite, good reading CollectD, reading StatsD. So a lot of these uh, existing uh, ecosystem things can be integrated in Prometheus as well, if you choose to use this engine. All right, thank you very much. On behalf of the LCA, I'd like to present you with this gift, and please join me in thanking him again as you walk out the room. Thank you.